I want to start by saying that I actually feel really uncomfortable standing here in front of you um, about to talk about what I'm going to talk about because I'm used to speaking, but I'm used to doing business speeches. I'm used to giving people my views on energy demand and so on. And it's quite unusual for me to actually speak about my learnings as a leader and what I've, I've learned from it. I'm also very conscious from the conversations this morning that I suspect many of you have already learned the things that have been so painful for me to learn over the last 30 years. But nevertheless, what I want to do is, over, over the next few minutes, is to just give you the four things which, as I've sat back, I left BP last summer, and it's taken me a year, really, to sort of properly integrate what I've learned so far. And I've come up, as of today, and this will probably change, with four key things, which were at the essence of, of my learning. And the first one was actually probably the hardest for me to learn. And it was absolutely the place I had to start, because until I sorted this one out, I couldn't do anything else inside the organization. It came up in my home group this morning. It's about ego. And until I learned that actually my ego was both my best friend and my worst friend, I, I, was, I couldn't do, um, I couldn't make change happen, really, and not make it stick. And ego is absolutely essential. You know, it is our protective mechanisms. Um, it's the way in which we process information, the way in which we make sense of the world. But of course, it is only one lens. And just like an eye cannot see itself, so you have to understand that it's your ego that is deleting, distorting, generalizing the world. And that it is just a lens. And I had to learn that I needed to accept it as that and accept other people had different lenses on the world. And it sounds so obvious, but actually it was an incredibly difficult thing for me as a leader in an organization supposed to have the answers to actually do. When I, uh, I took over responsibility for something called gas, power, and renewables, and I've had a passionate interest in the environment and sustainability for a long time. And I felt sure that there was a real opportunity for BP to get into renewable energy in a big way, and that that would be good business, but actually it would also be a massive strategic opportunity for BP, it would challenge the paradigm of the company and could provide a release of energy and creativity. So I, I really passionately wanted to do something about renewable energy broadly. And I started to campaign, but I campaigned from my ego. I campaigned with my data set, my ideas, my arguments, my views, and I didn't frankly get very far. Uh, and, and it took, actually, it wasn't something, it wasn't a realization I came to by myself. I actually had great people around me who helped me sort of understand that I had to let go of my own lens and realize, and realize it for what it was, simply a lens on the world. There's a great story about Picasso, um, which, I, which sort of just illustrates this. And um, he was on a train and the man sitting next to him engaged him in conversation. And after a while, he sort of plucked up enough courage. And he said, um, why don't you paint the world the way it really is? And Picasso said, what do you mean? And he said, well, look, here's a picture of my wife. And Picasso looked at it and he said, um, so she's rather uh, small and flat then. <laughs> and I just thought, yeah, you know, it's, it's only a lens, isn't it? Um, my second lesson actually required me to let go of an awful lot of the stuff I've been trained in. Um, it's something about the power of metaphor and models. And the dominant metaphor inside BP, which I think is probably the dominant metaphor in business, um, and certainly big business, is the mechanical model. It's this notion of the organization as a machine. And it's become so dominant. It's the notion that um, target setting and discipline take the place of intuition and rules of thumb. It's the notion that there is a, a relationship between input and output, and that you can determine 
that output. And I realized that this model just wasn't working. It wasn't generating the results that we wanted. And I went in search of another model. And the model that I came up with was the notion, not the mechanical model, but actually the notion of farming. The notion that actually my role as a leader was to sow seeds, to create the conditions for growth. Not to con I couldn't control the outcome. I didn't know which seeds would germinate. I didn't know whether there'd be enough rain, but I could create the conditions for growth. And for me, that metaphor works really, really well. So that was a step in my learning. But of course, you know, if you're going for a brain surgery, you really would like someone to know that there is a relationship between input and output. You would really like someone to have worked out um, the model that's going to make your brain operation work. There's a need for both. And I learned that actually I had to hold the paradox of both of them. And this notion of paradox has come up over and over and over again in my career. And a, a, an, an uncomfortable thing to have to deal with. It's the, the idea, um, what is it? Um, don't believe this sentence. I mean, you can't get it right, can you? You can't win with that. If you believe it, you haven't. If you do, if you, do you don't. And if you don't, you do. You can't, you, that creates immediately a paradox. And paradox, I found, is incredibly difficult to sustain, allow people to continue to hold it inside an organization for any period of time. But I became clear that actually in that paradox, there is the creativity. And so if you can allow people to hold both of these things, whether it be two different models, whatever it is, actually in that, you release the creativity of teams. So this notion of creating alternative energy, actually, I, I stopped my campaigning, which wasn't getting me very far to create a new business. And I deliberately set out trying to grow a business. I deliberately involved the people who were against the idea. Um, I brought them into the conversations. I created very open-ended spaces where we weren't trying to close down. We were continually opening up the inquiry, fueling it, if you like, watering it. That would be a better word, wouldn't it? Um, watering it with, with a lot of detailed analysis, a lot of facts and figures to, to, to feed the, the, the um, inquiry, but continually opening that inquiry out. And the process went on over, over many months. What was really interesting was that from that process, a picture of a new organization began to emerge. And it really did. It sort of it began to, to great, gain credibility in many different parts of the organization until it became quite clear. And what's most interesting was it was not the idea that I first started with. And actually, I had to let go of the idea I first started with to be able to sort of pick up this new idea, this new version of an alternative energy business which had gained credibility uh, and traction inside the organization. So that was, my, was really my second, second lesson. It was, about, it was about the power of metaphors and models, about using different models to actually create and challenge the way of thinking but having to recognize that they are only that. They are only models. And actually, you have to hold that the reality is somewhere in between. The reality is paradoxical. And that's where the real breakthrough and innovation occurs. In parallel with this model of organization as the machine, there is also, I think, a really powerful sort of underpinning idea of, of dualism. This notion of good and bad, success and failure, um, man manager and employee. And that underpins so much of the way in which the organization I came from worked. Last night, I went out to dinner with um, a former colleague and he was telling me of a frustration he had. He said, I've been out to the leaders, very big senior leaders of these businesses, and I've asked them to give me the 10 metrics that they need to run the business, the 10 things that, that they rely upon to, to run their business. And he said it was really frustrating because they couldn't do it. And what they came back to me with was, well, what is it you want? 
What is it head office is going to be measuring us on? What is it we're going to be paid against? And I said to him, well, why do you think that is? And he sort of thought for a bit. And he said, well, I know why it is. It's because my boss is so clear about the way in which he's going to pay, pay them. He's so clear about what it is he wants that they are not going to invest in, they're not going to spend any time and energy thinking for themselves. That leader had created the organization. He wasn't separate from it. He was it. Him being in that organization and behaving the way he behaved had created the behavior of the people in the organization. And I've just seen it so often. But it's a very difficult thing as the leader of the organization to remember that you are not separate from the organization. You are, you are the organization. And the way you behave and work actually creates the response, creates the organization. And so that was my sort of third lesson, the notion that actually, you know, I am the organization and, and what I do and how I behave and how I work will cause a response. And if I don't like the response I'm getting from the organization, then I better really look in the mirror because I'm probably responsible for it. The fourth les lesson was the most painful of all and the most difficult of all. Um, and it was the notion that actually, and, and well, don't get this wrong, but change is pain. You can't, unless, there is, unless it is a painful process, you're probably not getting the level of change that's possible. Um, but as a leader, all of my reactions, all of my instincts were to try and protect my organization from pain, to try and make it all right. And actually, I had to let go of that and say, no, this is going to be really quite painful. And it's, it's about, when you, when you create change and new ideas, fear and anxiety, as we talked about this morning, it's necessary. And your ego defense sort of kicks in, but actually you have to let it go. You have to go with the flow. You have to see where that flow takes you, as Nick was saying, because otherwise you won't get to a different place. And when I was... In, in my gas, power, and renewables business, I, I had a large meeting. About 100 people came together. And one of the first things I asked them to do was to pin up on the wall how they felt. How they felt about where the organization was, what it was doing, what it was trying to achieve. And so we got a wall like that full of post-it notes, and we sort of organized them all. And stood back from that wall and the wall became known as the wall of darkness. Because when you looked at it, it was a really powerful message from the organization that actually what we were doing wasn't working. And I, ha I had had lots of conversations with people in the organization, and I hadn't picked up that message strongly. But it was inescapable when we looked at that wall. But immediately, my own ego defense kicked in. You know, this is my organization. I've created it. I've set the strategy. We're delivering on our performance contracts. We're doing everything we've said we were going to do. How can, you know, that, how can this be? They just don't understand. They just don't understand the political reality in terms of what's possible. They, they, they can't see what it is we're trying to do. And in the bar that evening, after a couple of beers, um, one of my... My friends, one of my colleagues, took me to one side, and um, he said, you know, how, how do you think the day went? And I burst into tears. You know, how, how could I be so undermined by my organization that they didn't trust me, they didn't want me to lead them, they couldn't see what it was like I was trying to do? And he just stopped me, and he said, you know, they trust you enough with a gift. You better recognize that. You've earned that gift. What are you going to do about it? And it really made me sort of stop and think, OK? I'm, I had to sort of really have that conversation with myself about my ego and, and try and get my ego out of the way. And in the end, the organization, we, we broke the organization up into many different parts. Um, empires were, were deconstructed. Pet projects were let go of and released. But actually, that process of, of getting rid of the organization actually became a very painless process because people had been involved in the idea itself. They'd actually come up with the idea itself. It's not what I intended to do at all. 
They'd come up with this idea, and actually the change was a very smooth and easy one, not without its bumps, but a very smooth and easy one relatively to, to make happen. It did me out of a job, by the way. So, <laughs> so that was my fourth lesson. You know, this, this is a very painful thing to change, but you have to let the pain in and you have to deal with it. So those are my four lessons around unlocking creativity. Why does any of this actually matter? I think, it, I think when I look at the problems in the world today and where we are, I think we are being called upon for an extraordinary level of creativity that has never been seen before. There's this wonderful expression, I don't know how many of you know it, about super wicked problems. Who's come across super wicked problems? So I, this, I just love this notion of super wicked problems. So these are you know, really tricky, complex, changing problems, but they have some extra, three extra dimensions. Uh, one is that the people who are trying to solve them cause the problem. The second is that time is not on your side and is running out fast. And the third is that you are in serious danger of making decisions that your future self wouldn't want you to make. And that is precisely, I believe, the nature of problem that we're facing around water distribution rights, around climate change, around income redistribution. These are super wicked problems, and we are better to get super creative in a way that we've never done before if we're going to solve these problems. And I believe that's the challenge. And so if I have a question for you, my big question is, how are we going to release a level of creativity that we have never seen before? Because if we don't, I worry about the world my kids are going to inherit. Thank you. <laughs>